All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, we pray as always that this message is a message that you've got to have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled, but those that are bruised reeds, may, be we, may we be situated right. In your precious name, amen. What we're doing on Sunday morning is going through the book of 1 John, verse by verse. So please open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. Say amen if you're there. Hallelujah if you need more time. I heard a hallelujah. Very good. An unashamed hallelujah. That is, of course it sounded like Maverick. It is Maverick, and he's there now. And so we give God the glory for him being there. Amen. First John chapter 2. Maverick just speaks when others remain silent, but others were there. So amen, buddy. Amen. First John chapter 2. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth." Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the, the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. <clears throat> I need us to track with the whole thing this morning. The reason for that is I'm going to say some stuff that is controversial and some people might not like. So I want everyone to know where we're coming from this morning. So it's very important. The first part of the sermon is going to be relatively uncontroversial. Uh, but then we're going to get into some practical things. And some people I already know will be upset about some of these practical things. They will think in their minds, why is pastor picking or critiquing. And the reason for that is because of the text itself. So I need us to stick with it. First, John begins, children, who's he talking to? Who's the audience when he says children? Us. What do we call God? Father. We are his children. All right. So he's addressing all of us. And he begins by saying, it is the last hour. Notice the verbal tense. It is. A lot of times in our world, especially within American Christianity, we're constantly focused on, is this the time Jesus is coming back? As a matter of fact, there are organizations that made plenty of predictions that Jesus was going to come back, and he didn't at the time. Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. Do you remember that guy? It, it was years ago, Harold Camping, down in D.C. Do you remember those big signs that said Jesus is coming? And he set a date. Do you remember this? He set a date. Jesus is coming. It was on buses. Jesus is coming. And then I was like, that is the safest day for everybody on earth. And they said, why is that the safest day? Because it says nobody will know the day or the hour. So Harold thinks this is the day. So we're safe today. And it turns out we were safe today. We were safe that day. Because of the false predictions. It is. Look at what John says. It is the last hour. All right. That's very important. Every generation of Christians is supposed to believe and think, but more importantly, act as if Christ could come back when? Exactly. Because he can. It is the last hour. When did John write, it is the last hour? When did he write, when did he pen those words? 1,930 years ago, this John was the eldest of all the apostles. He died of old age, exiled on Patmos. He probably wrote 1 John around 85 to 90 A.D., okay? 
So 1,930 years ago, he said, children, it is, it is the last hour. Now, that's actually quite important. I want to talk about your Bibles for a minute. Your Bible is a miracle. First things first, the Old Testament was written from about 1500 B.C. to 400 B.C. That's amazing. 1,100 years, prophets spoke. Moses went up on the mountain around 1500 B.C. and got the first five books of the Bible. They were uh, transmitted from God directly to Moses, and he wrote them down. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's why the Bible begins with the beginning of the creation of the world. God transcribed it to Moses, okay? But he wrote it at 1500 B.C. So from 1500 B.C. to 400 B.C., you have your 39 books of the Old Testament. That's what you've got. Over 1,100 years, over a millennia, many prophets, many priests spoke, wrote, and we have the Scripture. Then, the New Testament, 27 books. Your entire New Testament was uh, written over a span of 50 years, from 45 A.D. to 95 A.D. Right around 95 is when John died. His last book was the book of Revelation, and he died. So from 45 to 95 A.D., your entire New Testament was written. How many books of the Bible are there after the book of Revelation? How many? None. That's significant. What John was saying is this is it. This is it. This is the last hour. It all ends, what? Now, with this. The book of Hebrews. Long ago and at many times, in many ways, many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. The last word from God, forgive me, the last necessary word from God came through whom? Jesus. The last necessary word from God came from Jesus. This is all, you've got to track with me because this is very important. Jesus, while he was dying on the cross, the spittle of humanity was dripping off of his face and he was dying there, said three fateful, important words. He said seven things from the cross, but one of the things he said was three words. It was the last three words he uttered before he died. The very last three words he uttered. What were those words? It is finished. Everything that needed to happen happened in the death, resurrection, life, ascension of Jesus Christ. He is the period to our salvation. Nothing else needed to happen after the ascension of Jesus Christ for us to be right with God, for us to be forgiven, for us to be given heaven as a promise the promise of the new heavens and the new earth, every single prophetic utterance of God is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why John can say, it is the last hour. It is the last hour, even though it was 1,930 years ago, because everything has been what? Completed. That's why you shouldn't listen to these prophecy hounds who say in 1947, when Israel became a nation, that was fulfilling prophecy. No, it wasn't, because everything was fulfilled through whom? Period. It's finished. It's done. You now have everything you need in these 66 books of the Old and New Testament for life and salvation in faith. You have everything you need. I didn't say God is done speaking to you. You have the Holy Ghost living inside of you. Amen. What I said was everything is fulfilled. It's done. You have everything you need. So I need you to hear that. With this Old and New Testament, everything for life and faith and godliness you need. Now, that doesn't mean everything you need for life in the general sense. For example, the Bible says feed the poor, but it doesn't give you lessons in cookery. So you do need other arts, right? It, it, the Bible says treat one another fairly, but it doesn't give you lessons in economics. Is that what I'm saying? So yes, of course we need the other sciences, but what I'm saying is everything you need to live right with God and godly living exists in the Old and New Testament that ended when John died. Understood? That is very, 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 very important, especially as we're going to go right now. Second Peter 1. His divine power has granted to us, everybody say the underlined portion with me, to us all things. His divine power has already granted to you everything you need that pertain to life and godliness. 
through the knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us, read with me, his precious and very great promises. Where are the promises of God written? In the Bible. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. So, we have all that we need in the Old and New Testaments. One of my seminary professors' favorite verses, and you know, as a student, when a professor says, this is my favorite verse, you remember it, you know, uh, because he's hot. Anyway, I always remembered it. For all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. What that says, and it says it in one sentence, so huge. Every single promise of the Bible is yours in Christ. That's an amazing sentence. For if there is a promise of God, there is a, the answer is yes to you in Jesus. So we don't need to wait for other promises to come to fulfillment. Everything has been what? Everything has been fulfilled. It's done in Christ. That is why through him we utter our amen to God for the glory. That's why in a lot of these places, if you watch Christian television late at night, a lot of times, I'm telling you, you're getting heresy. You've got a bunch of people that are saying, well, over in Jerusalem, they've got to build this temple, and then we're going to go, and we're going to sacrifice. Listen, they could build another temple in Jerusalem, but I'm going to tell you one dude that will never show up there and sacrifice an animal. That dude is Chris. And I'm going to tell you why I would never, ever, 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 ever do it. I would never do it because Christ is my sacrifice. Everything was fulfilled What? So build your temple. That's why I always, it's, it's cosmically sad. They're fighting over this land when in reality, if anybody should get that land, it should be us. And it's two groups of people that don't even get, that it doesn't even belong to. Because we're the ones that believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right. Every promise of God is found in Christ. Everyone. All right. Very important. Now, I just spent all this time making it clear that the Scripture declares that the Scripture itself is finished. We have no more books of the Bible. We have all that we need in those 66 books. And that is uh, now the stepping stone. Here comes a bunch of the controversial stuff that I'm about to say. John says this. Now, that stuff upsets people outside the church. Stuff I'm about to say is going to upset people in it. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many antichrists have come. When did John say that? 1,930 years ago. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Look at this very important. They went out from us. That means these antichrists claimed the name of Jesus. They went out from us, meaning they were a part of our group. But because of what they were teaching and doing, it became very clear that they came out from us, but they are not what? They aren't of us. Beloved, this spirit of Antichrist, I'm not talking about the false faiths at this point. I'm not talking about Hinduism. Uh, I'm not talking about Islam. I'm not talking about New Age religion. They didn't come, what? From us. So he's saying, hey guys, you've got to be very careful because there's people that will come from us, but then because of what they're doing, and I'll tell you what they're doing, they're adding to this, or they're subtracting from it. That's what they're doing. That's why I spent the first part of the sermon to say, this is what? Complete. You can't change it, and this is all you need. Because there's people coming from us that are going to add to it or subtract from it. At John's time, let's start with John's time. It were these people called the Gnostics. Raise your hand if, let's say, on the History Channel or from some buddy of yours that doesn't want to believe in the Bible, something like that, you've heard the tale that there are books that were kept out of the Bible uh, and that, you know, those books, it was the evil church that kept those books out of the Bible and that's why the Bible is what it is. Raise your hand if you've heard that story before. All right, a lot of us. I just need you to know that story is garbage. And I'll tell you why it's garbage. Most of the time when you watch your history channel and they're like, the Gospel of Thomas, that's a Gnostic book written in the second century well after Thomas died. Then you've got the Gospel of Peter and all these other ones. That's second and third century. 
That's not the first century church. In addition, they directly contradict. I challenge you. You go right ahead. It's on the internet right now. You go right ahead and Google the Gospel of Peter. You're going to read it and notice that it's trash immediately because you've heard Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the eyewitness testimony. You go right ahead and do it. I have no fear because you're going to see immediately how silly it is. What the Gnostics believed was that you needed secret knowledge that wasn't given to you unless you had this ethereal knowledge. It sounds new agey, which just tells you the new age movement is not new. It sounds new agey, this, this knowledge that you needed in order to attain salvation. They taught that Jesus was not really a physical human being, that the physical world is bad, directly, of course, contradicting Genesis chapter 2. When God created the physical world, what did he declare? It is very good. So they, de they declared that the physical is bad. Jesus only appeared to be physical. He's the Christ idea. And you need secret knowledge to be saved. A to total direct contradiction. They wrote their own books. They called it scripture. So what did they do to these 66 books? They added to it. They added. When this is all you need, they added. All right. Now, where do we see this? You know, sometimes us in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod get ashamed of some of our doctrine because we're afraid of how upsetting people are going to be. So I need you to buckle up. It's part of our Lutheran confessions. It's called the power and the primacy of the Pope. What did the Reformers always declare to be Antichrist? The Pope and the office of the Pope. I want to step back and talk about why. Because the Roman Catholic religion is one billion strong. Let's talk a little bit about why. Roman Catholic religion is Trinitarian, without question, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But listen to some of the things that they teach. It's very important. First, they teach the perpetual virginity of Mary, meaning Mary never had intercourse with Joseph. Jesus had no other children. <clears throat> I've often challenged, and I have many Roman Catholic friends, especially I'm politically aligned with many of them. But I always ask, show me in the 66 books of the Old and New Testament where Mary is said to be a perpetual virgin. Where is it? It's not there. As a matter of fact, in there, especially in the book of Mark, we see that Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. If Mary was a perpetual virgin, I got to tell you, they shouldn't be praying to her. They should be thanking God for Joseph. What a saint that dude would be, right? All right, the simple fact of the matter is, okay. So they teach the perpetual virginity of Mary. In addition, you and I, when we talk about or when we hear the immaculate conception, raise your hand if you've ever heard that phrase, immaculate conception. Do you know... When you hear the word immaculate conception, I guarantee you that you're thinking of the conception of the Christ in the womb of Mary when you hear that phrase, right? That is not what they mean. Look it up. The official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, immaculate conception, is that Mary is conceived sinless. Someone needs to show that to me. In addition to that, on October 31st, we celebrate the Reformation. On October 31st, the Roman Catholic religion celebrates the Assumption of Mary. Do you guys have any idea what that means, the Assumption of Mary? They believe that Mary was assumed in bodily form, so she's already risen again, like Christ, in bodily form to the right hand of Jesus, and she is called the co Co, what, if I'm a co, what? Beth and I are co-parents of faith, hope, joy, and Olivia, right? What does it mean to be co? She's assumed to heaven, and she is the co-redeemer of humanity. They would never say that Mary is the Christ. They wouldn't never say that, but they behave in such a fashion, what? As if she is. Many of you know the Hail Mary. Let's say it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy woman, Jesus. And then what? Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, what? Amen. Boom, right there. Pray for us. Right there, right there, right there. You want to know why praying to saints is forbidden? Not just forbidden, but forbidden strongly. Not only because they're dead. Think about it. 
when I talk to my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, what they will say to me is this. Well, what's the difference? You ask your wife, I ask Mary, I ask Luz, I ask Jim to pray for me. What's the difference? Why can't I ask someone who's dead? And I'll say, well, I'll tell you why. If my wife were in China with no technology, would I go out of my door, open up my front door, stop and go, hey, Beth, I need you to pray for me. Would I do that? Well, she might hear me, all right, but still, <laughs> she might. But why wouldn't I step out of my front door and scream, Beth, pray for me? Because why? Why? Who assumed that dead people take on an attribute of the Almighty, which is omnipresence? The reason praying to saints is forbidden is because the saints are human. They're not omnipresent. They don't see you. They can't hear you. They can't talk to you. They can't advocate for you. They're dead. They're in glory. So it is vain, specious idolatry to pray to a saint. It is absolute idolatry. Mediums are condemned in the Scripture. What's a medium? Talking to what? Someone has to tell me why you get to talk to dead people, but they can't. Now, how did it all come to be? Because there's two forms of authority in the Roman Catholic religion. We have one. What's the one we have? They have two. What are their two? Scripture and the magisterium, tradition throughout the ages. Everything I just mentioned was not original. It came through thousands of years of tradition. So what it is, is an addition. Remember when I start, started, when I said, when Jesus said it is finished, what did he mean? So you don't get the right to add. You don't get that right. It's done. If it doesn't say it, you don't have to believe it. And if it contradicts what it says, you certainly ought not practice it. Forbidding marriage to the priesthood, what a catastrophe that has caused. Peter, I don't even understand it. They claim Peter to be their first pope. You know what Peter was? Married. It's crazy. What a catastrophe that one doctrine has caused so many people. The simple fact of the matter is when you add to the Bible... It's, uh, it's horrible. Now, they aren't alone, of course, in any of that. <clears throat> 1 John 2, 23. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Again, what I said was, they will absolutely say that he is the Christ, without question. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is why we've said you can be saved in the church, because their baptism is a, an official baptism. But he's not the only one there, by virtue of wh what they practice. Now, you've got Charles Taze Russell, the Jehovah Witnesses. What he did not him alone, but the Jehovah's Witness organization, this wasn't good enough. So they changed it and made Jesus an angel. Then you've got Joseph Smith, the Mormon church. What did he do? He found a whole new book. He added to it. That's the thing, isn't it? This is why I spent the first part of the sermon saying, it is what? It's done. It's done. Everything you need for life and faith and godliness are in your Old and New Testaments. Scripture was closed at 95 AD when the Apostle John died. Nothing else needs to be believed. It needs to be applied, and it needs to be applied in new ways. Amen. But it's always this. Have you ever noticed that the problems also now in many of the liberal denominations? It's them taking what? Taking it away. It doesn't really say that. It doesn't really mean that. So the simple fact of the matter, why did I spend all this time here? And I'm going to tell you why. It's not to be a, uh, a jerk. Because what does the text say? The Antichrist came from us, out of us, claiming to be us. But what? Not of us. So we must be warned. 
We must see this for what it is. It's dangerous and it's important to talk about. Now, why is it important to talk about this, to have the Jesus that's found only in the 66 books of the Old and New Testament? Why? I'm going to share a story with you. It's a story of victory. I want to end with a good story. I know. Amen. This person is long since dead. He died before we built a new building, so don't look around and go, I wonder who he's talking about. Uh, Nobody in this building is a relative of this person that I'm talking about. Nobody's a relative, okay? So don't look around and go, hmm, I wonder. All right, you don't know them. Ha, 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 ha. That's why I'm telling the story. Okay. But when I was first a pastor, uh, if, you, if you've been here a long time, you know this. Uh, I preached through different books of the Bible. Right now we're in First John. Well, at that time, I was going through the book of Luke, verse by verse. And we were at the genealogy. And uh, obviously it talks about uh, the Virgin Mary. By the way, she is blessed. She was given the greatest gift that uh, any person could possibly give. We should imitate her faith. But is she someone that can save us? No. Amen. All right. So anyway, we were talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he always critiqued every sermon I ever gave. No problem. But at the end there, he shook my hand and he goes, man, that really just sucked. And I said, and I said well... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And so I called him and uh, uh, I met him in my office the next week. And I said, all right, man, wh- what's the problem? What's going on? He goes, well, I'll tell you what my problem is. Haven't we gotten past all this, this whole Virgin Mary thing, this whole rising from the dead thing, this, come on, it, just tell us how to live a good life. And I said, you know, here's the problem that I got. The Bible is really clear on this, that we need this Jesus, this Jesus that really was born of a virgin, this Jesus that really died, this Jesus that really rose again. Well, soon after our conversation, he gets cancer, and it's really bad, and it's pancreatic cancer, and he starts to die, and he seeks out somebody, somebody that really believed, somebody that would take the insults and smile. You know who that somebody was? It was me. And he said, I need to talk to a guy that really what? Really believes it. And I was able to hold his hand. And I was able to say, listen, man, right about now you need that conservative Jesus. That Jesus that was really born. That Jesus that really died and that Jesus that really rose again. And in tears he confessed his sins and he believed in the real Jesus. But he needed a guy. I'm just telling you, he needed a guy. In his whole circle, who's a guy that really what? Believes it. And then I was there when he was close to his last breath. Uh, breath. I saw him the night before he died. And uh, he died, and I'm convinced he's in heaven. And I was able to preach his funeral. And we give God the glory for that. This is why it's very, 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 very important. We don't add to this. And I don't care what the culture says. We don't take away from it. Because the world needs a real Jesus, a Jesus that really died, a Jesus that really rose again, a Jesus that is the only Savior. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The Jesus we need to trust in, the Jesus we need to believe in, the Jesus we need to cling to. Amen? God is good. All the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. Father, I pray that we would believe in the Jesus of the Bible. In your precious and holy name, amen.